Welcome to Listeners this summer episode 113 of the Slump Buster Podcast. Joining Kyle and myself on today's episode is Cole Jacobson. Cole is a next-gen stats researcher at NFL Media. Gives us a little insight into that world, what stats are here to stay, what stats have to go, and what's next in the world of next-gen gen stats but before we welcome in Cole, it's time to give a shout out to our partners caveman coffee co caveman is a fantastic single source single origin goodness from a company with impeccable taste and ethics the people behind it are beautiful souls and the coffee is delicious fuel for the never-ending quest to do better be better love harder and enjoy deeper guys i tell you their nitro cold brew is the perfect blend of energy and refreshment in the morning Great way to start the day, but why stop there? They have their mammoth blends, which I highly encourage you getting. They have their hibiscus teas, which are delicious. And guys, if you use our promo code slump, you get 15% off your next purchase of any of these fantastic products. Kmancoffeeco.com, promo code slump. Guys, don't be a chump. Use promo code slump and get yourself a case today. All right, y'all. Cole Jacobson, Juju Talk Sports, Kyle Ledbetter. Let's get it. Let's bust the slump and let's enjoy. Cole, how are you doing today, man? Doing well. Thanks for having me on. How did you find yourself in the research department for uh, Next Gen Stats? Was that just something that always kind of like you navigated towards? I see you're a math major from University of Pennsylvania. Uh, how did that come to be? Um, yeah, definitely a long path there, I would say. For starters, we're talking my life in a broader sense. I mean, football's always been the biggest passion of mine. I played in high school and I played what's called sprint football at Penn, which you probably haven't heard of, but what sprint essentially is, is I call it Pop Warner for college kids. So it's still tackle football, 11 on 11, same field size and everything like that. But there's a weight limit for every position, no matter what you play, which as of now is 178 pounds. So played that again in high school and college and football was a major part of my life. And coming out of school, I graduated Penn in 2019. By that point in life, I was certain I wanted to work in sports and particularly in football, just to keep that in my life in some capacity. Definitely a lot of swings and misses during that senior year, applying to different jobs, but Ultimately, during that summer of 2019, and actually at that point, I was already volunteering for UCLA football in their recruiting department. And at the time, my plan was just sort of to scrap my way up there, kind of try to get from volunteer to part-time to full-time, no matter how long it took. But ultimately, I applied to an NFL research job on a whim and it ended up working out. But actually, that job's not the one I have right now. To summarize, NFL research has three kind of sub-departments. The three are editorial, analytics, aka next-gen, and fantasy. So my original job was editorial research. That's the one I got in 2019. And I was there for two seasons. And then during this summer made the transition to the next gen team and that's where I am today yeah I know you said that you kind of wanted to like settle into that before we kind of had this interview had you on before so how's kind of like that process been kind of moving over to that department how big is your team first of all I kind of want to like get a feel for like what all goes into developing some of these stats that we hear that we never even thought about or heard about like 10 years ago 15 years ago 20 years ago are you just kind of like think of new stat ideas new formulas new ways to evaluate players what is kind of like that research like yeah, I think our team is smaller than you would think, or at least than I assume you would think. So in terms of next-gen stats researchers, there are four of us. We have a manager, Bill Smith, and then three researchers under him, me and two other people. It isn't fair to call that the whole team because there's also a different staff called next-gen stats analysts. And they're you know, technically a different department, but we collaborate with them a lot. And they're actually, just to summarize briefly, they're kind of more directly involved with the live broadcast. If a game is on NBC or CBS or Fox, they might be feeding those anchors live information. Whereas my team, the next-gen stats researchers, we're more about NFL Network and supplying stuff that'll get used on TV during you know our TV shows during the weekdays, you know, things like Total Access or NFL Now, if you've heard of those kind of shows. So if you combine us together, we probably have close to 10 people. I'd say it's still a pretty small group when you think about it. You mentioned it. I am kind of like shocked that that is the team. That is the base of your guys' operation. Now, is it just all exclusively like math majors like yourself, statistics majors, or is it kind of like a good variety of different kind of backgrounds that kind of came together to form that team? Uh, yeah, it's definitely not strictly people with quant analysis majors like I did. In the researchers and analysts, we have slightly different roles, but for the research standpoint, there's really not that much hard, you know, quantitative analysis needed. Like definitely a basic background in statistics helps just because you know how to frame things in the right way. It's going to look good on TV, but I definitely don't need to be doing, you know, fancy stuff like standard deviations or Monte Carlo simulations in my day-to-day -day life. And even for the analysts, I think it's not quite as that necessary either. I do think for the people that really make the website work, even NGS engineers team as well, they don't really need to know the football side. They're just, their core responsibility is how do we get this data from 
from the players' pads to the nextgenstats.com website. So those guys definitely have to have a pretty major computer science slash programming background because yeah, what they do just to make that website work probably goes beyond anything I could even comprehend. But in terms of people that really are in the weeds with the football stuff, again, my team and the analysts, I think there's ultimately not that much hard quant analysis needed. Well, so you mentioned that you go from taking that information and then try to translate it to television and make it so that the viewer, you know, kind of understands it. So does that process involve a little bit of like dumbing things? That feels like a lot of like public relations type stuff. Uh, exactly. I would say the constant challenge for us is not just what can we find that's informative, it's how can we find stuff that's informative and then also that's going to be comprehended by the people watching on TV. There's no way we can ever complete the process of perfecting what the fans are going to love, but where it's always ongoing, we're trying to figure out what appeals to the fans. So I think things like player speed, that always gets people excited because it's super easy to understand. Things like air yards, you know, how far a ball goes beyond line of scrimmage when it's in the air. Um, so yeah, that's what we're always trying to approach is I mean, we have all this information that we get from the chips and the pads, which is awesome, but how do we twist and turn it? How we make it into something that's going to be a good product on TV. Now for yourself, Cole, you have a kind of diverse background. You mentioned you did a little bit of journalism. You did a little bit of like researching. Uh, you worked for the team out there in UCLA. What is your long-term plan? Would you like to be with a franchise, a team moving forward? Or would you like to stick in kind of like this uh, media kind of setting? Uh, longer term, I would like to be on a team in some capacity, whether that means pro or college. I think given my background, both playing the sport, but then also being a math major and stat minor, I think any kind of role that could really combine both scouting and general analytics would be something that would be awesome for me in the long term. It's being part of football locker rooms for so many years, you, know, you miss that competitive aspect of really chasing something. You know, with the media job is great. I definitely am enjoying it a lot. And I'm, I'll be super happy if I end up staying here, you know, a couple more years or whatever it ends up being. But, you know, in the world of TV, it's kind of, you know, the show you're working on airs and it's done and you rinse and repeat the next day, but really being part of an organization where you're chasing something that matters, you know, a league championship or a Super Bowl, even if you're with an NFL team or college, you know, national championship, whatever it might be, just having that day-to-day -day goal you are chasing. I think that's irreplaceable in life. That's something I do want to get back at some point, but you know, ultimately we plan and God laughs is kind of, you know, what I say. It's just, you can never really cherry pick what job you're going to get one day. All you can do is approach the job you have right now, full throttle with every ounce of effort you can give and then let the chips fall where they may from there. Well, you mentioned before also that you kind of lucked your way into this job. So it wasn't something that you had initially like intended to get into as an industry. And then, you know, one thing led to another. Exactly. Yeah, it's a great example of it. You know, as of graduation, you know, May 20th, 2019, my plan was to be at UCLA and probably stick around there for seasons, living at home the whole time and trying to scrap my way up. And then probably no more than a month or maybe six weeks later, I had this NFL offer and all of a sudden my life path is totally different. So anything can happen. So all you can do is approach what's in front of you with the best effort you can give and see what happens from there. If you do find yourself working with the team, definitely, I, I think a background in numbers analysis and these next gen stats, I, I think can be useful as we've seen more more and more teams start to integrate both analytics versus analytics, trying to separate what kind of is the best way to evaluate players. What statistics in football now that have come about recently do you find most useful whenever you're looking at a potential prospect, if you find yourself in the role of trying to evaluate a player? Um, it's a good question. I mean, at least for me personally, most of my scouting experience comes with college, you know, at UCLA, therefore scouting high school players. And obviously when you're scouting high school players, there's not that much advanced statistics available because, you know, there's no next gen stats for high schoolers. It's not like pro football focus is tracking high school games. So in that regard, I think old school film analysis is the best thing you can do at that level. And even if you were talking at the big time level, you know, if you were a pro scout scouting college guys, I would say it's, it's got to be a mix of film and analytics study. And I think there's always those Twitter wars, like is film analytics better? And the obvious right answer is they have to supplement each other. There's never going to be an optimal solution where one of them makes the other obsolete. You have to have that collaboration process uh, specifically as it pertains to like, if we want to get into the nuggets of like what specific stats are good talking about PFF, I like their accuracy rate a lot. I think it is a good way to kind of go beyond completion percentage because you know, basically completion percentage doesn't account for you know, passes that are dropped or some things that were incomplete outside of the QB's control. You know, if he got crushed as he threw the ball, whereas accuracy accuracy rate is kind of a still imperfect, but much better way to evaluate the QB's performance in a nutshell. You're looking at other positions, you know, I think missed tackles for us for ball carries is a great stat. Looking at offensive line, you know, they track how many times you get beat by a defender, even if there's no pressure, they track pressures, they track, you know, QB hits and sacks, obviously. So I do think there's so much out there that just goes beyond the, the old school, you know, metrics of yards and touchdowns and receptions, all that kind of stuff that of course there's more room for improvement. I think football's still analytically behind of sports like baseball and basketball, but there's already been so many leaps and bounds made that it makes evaluating players just a lot more more thorough and it gives you a much better chance to really get a full picture of somebody well and those leagues also had like an eight to ten year head start with the Moneyball revolution that kind of just matriculated down further too i wanted to ask you about the college recruiting process because i've been fascinated by this for a while and you obviously have some experience behind that and like there's no universal database for high school recruiting and college recruiting and being on the 
West Coast, obviously there's like different regions within college football. So what kind of goes into the process of recruiting high school type players and in, in trying to get them to UCLA or Oregon or even larger schools? Yeah, well, what I would say, I guess, for starters, there might not be one universal database, but I think there are some databases that are kind of very commonly seen across the country. Like one is called UC Report, stands for Underclass Report. Another one's called Jump Forward. Those are the kind of sites where any high school player who's like even close to being on your radar will have a profile there. And if they don't have one, you'll make one pretty quickly if you find out who they are and if they're you know anything you know decent on the field. So that definitely gives you a good starting point. You know, they're very thorough. They're, you know, if you're on UC Report, you can you can type in various filters. You can say, I want kids who are in the class of 2000. 23 and who are at least six feet and who play, you know, either outside or inside linebacker and, and so on. And I want to see if they have five or more FBS offers or whatever you want to put in there. It kind of really helps you do the digging of finding guys that you think might be a good fit for your program. But after that first initial step of getting guys on your radar, at least from UCLA standpoint, what I would say is that academics and character matter a lot. Of course, obviously we have tons of guys going through the tape, watching film, like figuring out if they're good enough to play for us to begin with. But even if you meet that threshold, you're not getting an offer unless you pass a thorough vetting of you know, what your grades look like like you know have we interviewed your coaches and other you know authority figures in your life even family like do we know that you're a high character person that you're going to fit in this program and really going to be somebody who might stick around you know all four years and that's definitely what stuck out to me because obviously I'd never really been involved in that process uh, before I got to UCLA and just seeing how thoroughly they care about what the person is like off the field was something that stuck out to me you know so I can't really speak for other schools I don't know how it's done in other buildings but at least for us that's something that is a major major factor in how these rosters are being built and at least this year for UCLA you're seeing it pay off on the field yeah I was just about to mention UCLA obviously coming off a rough loss here to Fresno State recently, but the past couple of years, and you've been along for that ride, they have made a little bit of a turnaround. How do you think kind of like their process has changed over the last couple of years? And what kind of stuff do you notice with someone at the top, specifically Chip Kelly in this case, that he does to help in that recruiting process and reaching out to players and finding that diamond in the rough? I think the improvement has been there, you know, across Chip's tenure. It's been slow, but it has been there. You know, look, three and nine to four and eight to three and four. Now this year to being above 500 finally. So the progress has been there, even though it's been a bit slow. But the biggest thing that sticks out to me about this year's team is how veteran it is. You know, there's so many, you know, juniors and seniors and fifth year guys, and even a few six year guys. I know, you know, the offensive lineman, Paul Gratton, running back, Britton Brown, a few grad students who are in their six years of college. And I think the biggest reason for that is just, you know, the culture there. And I know culture is such a commonly used buzzword. I think people say it and don't even really bother to think about what it means. But when I think back to what I previously said about how character and academics matter so much in the process, it's because we recruit guys knowing that both have the academic discipline and just the general character to want to stick around here, even if adversity happens. And needless to say, a lot of adversity happened those first two years, you know, three and nine, then four and eight in 2018 and 19. And a lot of guys might want to jump ship immediately when you see numbers like that. But this group of veterans that you know, were underclassmen then are now upperclassmen leaders. They stuck around and they're willing to put in the work and try to get the program to a much better place. And now this year being a top 25 team, it's clear that that's been paying off. So so that's what sticks out to me the most about this year's personnel. And broadly, I'd say in terms of how we find diamonds in the rough, I would definitely point to Ethan Young, a director of player personnel there. He's kind of Chip's right-hand man. It's when you walk in Ethan's office, it is a ridiculous array of like every college player or high school player's name is like on a different part of his wall, like every direction you look. And he's just a tireless worker and always finds guys that might be potential transfer candidates and that sort of stuff and guys that might have the grades to fit in here. And obviously we watch tons of high school tape like any other college program does, but what he does to seek out again those diamonds in the rough guys that maybe nobody else would even think of is a major asset to the program and I know he's been a huge asset and why this year's team has been a lot better how fired up were you after Ed Ogeron's comments a couple weeks ago uh, that was fun for sure. Actually, I was sort of salty in the sense that I was supposed to be at that game because I get free tickets through working there over the summertime. But when I went to put my name and my friend's name down for tickets, it turned out there was a Friday 7.30 a.m. deadline, which I had no idea existed. So I go on the website to what I think is going to be a lock for my free tickets and they're not there. So I have to watch from home instead. So for selfish reasons, I was disappointed. But obviously watching the game, like it was so much fun. Like, because you can tell, obviously, if you know football at all, that was not a fluke win at all. It really outplayed them start to finish. Such domination in the trenches, you know, running the ball well all day. You know, Charbonnet couldn't be stopped both as a runner and receiver. And just to see the team really outplay a program of that caliber was super satisfying for sure. Have you gotten actually to interact with Chip much at all while working with the program? Pretty much not at all, honestly. Not at all. I mean, I'll see him in the weight room maybe if I overlap him with there. I'll say what's up briefly, but in recruiting, so say my supervisors are the recruiting analysts, full time guys, um, Pete Mayberry, Brandon Jones, and then our new hire, Jordan Bland, got there right before I left at the end of the summer. And then ahead of them is Ethan Young, the guy I mentioned before. And that's about the highest people I interact with in a work setting. Uh, like if I'm at practice, you know, on the field, like I might briefly interact with coaches if I'm helping out in a drill or something or I'm videotaping something. But yeah, the guys I really work with are Ethan and the guys under him. So not quite as high as chip. 
Yeah, it feels like the opposite of next gen stats where you guys have like four people working in your department and college football teams have these massive staffs that go into recruiting and coaching and administrative work and fundraising for the school. Like it's a massive operation. I mean, the Watson football center, it's what they call the building where the practice fields are and the weight room and all the coaches office. It's like a small city in there. There's people I have no idea who they are. Like, it's just the way it is over there. All right, Cole, I have an important question. It goes to a recent topic this week that actually came up. Do you think that Bill Gates and a stat sheet could win football games um if he's like the lead guy in charge i'm ultimately going to say no i think again no matter how analytically strong you are i think you got to have that background of knowing the sport but i absolutely think he could be a major supplemental role to you know a high level role to a very successful team if you think about a guy like i, mean, I know he played football at harvard so it's not an apples to apples comparison but paul des podesta who used to work for the dodgers and now works for the browns and i forgot his title but he's definitely somewhere like high up like very near andrew barry the gm and like they've been so successful since they brought him in and that whole ivy type regime andrew barry from harvard kevin stefanski from penn de podesta from harvard so yeah i think the browns who sucked for so long are a great example of how getting smart people in your building is going to pay off in the long run. I only ask you that mm-hmm. question because Joe Judge, the New York Giants head coach, actually dropped in a comment this week. Well, you know, he believes that analytics should be more used as a tool. He doesn't believe that obviously just like a super smart individual with a spreadsheet is the difference maker there. And then that comes into that argument, the meathead head coach versus the analytics department and finding that right balance between the two. What would you say is a healthy percentage between an analytics department and traditional player evaluation? It's a good question. I'd say around 50-50, but obviously it varies based on the situation, I think. In terms of player evaluation, that's where I think it actually should skew more in the direction of kind of old school film type, because no matter how good the analytic metrics are, there's still stuff that shows up on tape that you really can't account for, you know? And maybe Next Gen Stats says that Tom Brady completed 7 of 10 deep passes in a game, but maybe you watch a tape and it turns out two of those passes were tipped by a defender and happened to fall into somebody's hands, you know, things like that, where the tape is going to help you out. I think on the flip side, I think in terms of in-game strategy, things like when to use timeouts, when to go for in a fourth down, when to kick a field goal. In that regard, I think it should actually be heavily skewed in the favor of analytic metrics. I think the things that are out there now, like EPA, expected points added, WPA, win probability added, and all that kind of stuff that's out there that is just available at the press of a button now because the calculations have already been pre-made. I think that can help coaches so much. I think Joe Judge is like, I know the stereotype about him is like, he'll punt it on fourth and three, no matter where the field position is or what the score is like. And that that should not be part of the game anymore. You know, we have the tools now to know that like, going forward in situation X is going to help you boost your chances of winning this game. There's no reason any coach should not take the advantage when they have in front of them. Have you noticed over the years that the math is changing around going forward on fourth down or kicking field goals versus going forward on fourth down or things like that? I don't think the math itself is changing. I think that what's changing is how people are embracing it. And I think the current generation of coaches, yeah, they're for the most part, much more willing to attack it and use the numbers to their advantage. You know, if you guys have heard of Ryan Paganetti, you know, he talked extensively about this. He used to work for the Eagles. I think his title was, uh, was a game control manager or something in that realm where basically his role was in-game strategy advice, like telling Doug Peterson, hey, this is where we should go for This is where we shouldn't. Yeah, broadly, I think it coaches are much more willing to embrace it. And you still see exceptions. You know, I remember, I think it was the Titans. I think they had like a fourth and two from the opposite four in the playoff game down by six last year with five minutes left they punted and I think they didn't see the ball again or maybe they got it back with like a minute left I forget the details but you still see situations where somebody makes the clear wrong decision you're watching on tv you're like what the hell are you doing man it's such an obvious play here but (laughs) for the most part I think it's trending in you know the direction of people being more aggressive and for the right reasons yeah, that was me with LaFleur. I was screaming at my TV last year when he kicked the field goal with like 211 left in the game. I, I couldn't believe what I was watching. <laughs> right, right. That was a tough one for sure, obviously. Both Kyle and I are we were definitely big time baseball fans. And Kyle mentioned that those sports like baseball and basketball have had more of a jump in terms of analytics research. When I first was growing up, obviously pitchers win loss records was almost like a be all end all stat batting average. And now that's kind of gone the way of the dinosaur. I mean, we got WOBA, we got XFIP, we got ERA plus, uh, OPS plus, all these different ways of looking at players. So we mentioned earlier some statistics that are probably more essential now, but what are some statistics that you think should go the way of the dinosaur in terms of looking at guys? Yeah, the obvious ones that come to mind are just sort of the football equivalent of pitcher wins and losses, which... Well, first off would be QB wins and losses that, I mean, of course, over a huge sample size, it's going to be informative. Like any QB who has 150 plus career wins probably is a pretty good player, you know, over a sample size that big, even the most basic stats will probably tell you something important. But as it pertains to individual games, even individual seasons, you know, and Mitch Trubisky was 12 and 4 in 2018. It doesn't mean he's a top five QB in the league. It just means in a great situation, a first year coach where no one knew how to attack them. Obviously one of the best defenses in the league I've seen in recent memory, that sort of stuff. So definitely I think QB wins and losses is among the ones I've mentioned first. That's one I did mention first. 
first. And then I said, you know, generally, you know, passing yards, rushing yards, you know, touchdowns of all type. Those are just kind of the basic things that don't account for game situation. You know, a 10 yard pass on third and 20 is not as difficult to get as a 10 yard pass on third and seven. And of course, defensive scheme too, you know, it's easier to clean a six yard hitch against a cover four is much easier than, you know, if they're playing press, you know, no held man. So that kind of stuff, yards, touchdowns, and even on the flip side of defense, you know, I would say tackles. That's another one that, again, if a large sample size, if you lead the league in tackles in three straight years, you're probably a good player. But over an individual game, you know, if you make eight tackles, it doesn't mean you played that well necessarily. You just might have been in the right place at the right time based on the offense's play calling. So, yeah, I think those kind of bigger picture, like, and admittedly the TV friendly stats, you know, yards, touchdowns, tackles, I think those are the ones that kind of will eventually sort of they might still be on tv because they're interesting but i think they'll people are going to treat them as less informative in terms of evaluating players mentioned the the game scenario situation where obviously if your team is down you're going to throw more passes and you play different opponents and it's why i as someone who kind of frequents between meathead analyst and someone who's statistically nerdy i love the dvoa stat that football outsiders throws out and you were obviously freelance reporting for football outsiders which i was kind of interested about because dude, you mentioned that like that's not a huge part of your background, but um, how'd you get into journalism and reporting? Yeah, I guess working for going way back. Uh, during most of my high school days, I was a trumpet player, very average at best one, I would say. And then I still was super into sports at the time. I played football and track in high school and obviously was a major sports fan as well. And I'd always read the sports section of our school paper and kind of be intrigued by it and think to myself, I could probably do this if I wanted to. And I had a few friends on the paper, you know, eventually that kind of talked me into trying it out. So entering senior year of high school, I decided to ditch the trumpet, join that on a whim. And I was hooked right away. And I loved reporting on sports for high schools. So and I stuck with it in college. I joined our college newspaper at Penn called the Daily Pennsylvanian, which was a super awesome experience. Just very rewarding and I learned a lot and met a lot of great people I did two years as a sports editor for them 2017 and 2018 that was definitely my start in journalism and and from there even though my NFL media job is it's kind of still journalism in a way I mean it's it's not you know, traditional newspaper stories but it's still you know, writing about sports and contributing to a broadcast journalism so it's similar because they're the same skill sets of doing research finding out what you need to know and writing about it from there but that's not traditional journalism but I would say my side projects for things like well, the football outsiders and then I've also done a little bit for bleeding green nation the Eagles SB Nation affiliate page. So those have been the outlets where I can sort of continue to, you know, write, you know, real like long form type journalism stuff. And also at the same time, boost my football analytics skills, learn how to use our programming more and put out stuff that is interesting about football, you know, film or general strategies. I'm kind of curious there. You mentioned your guys' programming. What does kind of like that look like for, obviously you're working for the NFL, the NFL media group. So you mentioned the team's not that big, but what type of programs and ways of like pulling up thousands of players over what 70 plus years 100 plus years of football i'm sure that that's just a comprehensive system you guys have to work with uh, if we're started so it's a bit unclear because we're on audio and not typing it up i meant r programming like the letter r it's a programming language that i use for some oh, of my projects okay. fair, fair enough uh, yeah, easy mishap obviously uh that's a, a statistical like a coding language that i've tried to teach myself over the past few years but i am still curious at the tools right i'll still answer use. your question as well um <laughs> yeah, we have tons of databases that we use for NFL research. It's kind of a mix. Some of them are publicly available stuff like Pro Football Reference we're on all the time and that's obviously something that's free to the public or at least most of it is free. They have like the stat head separate thing that we pay for to get more you know, in-depth stuff. Yeah, with Pro Football Reference we had Sport Radar if you've heard of them. Actually, unfortunately there was a little contract dispute you know, levels above my pay grade. I had nothing to do with it but we unfortunately lost them this season but we've replaced them with a site called True Media. Again, they're not like next gen. They're more of the basic stats and completion percentage yards, touchdowns, that sort of stuff but the stuff that you still need to make a TV broadcast go. Let's see, we have Stats Pass, which is kind of another one in the realm of true media, again, more like big picture stats. And then uh, on the analytics side, we have PFF and Next Gen Stats. Those are the two go tos for sure. Uh, it's interesting because Next Gen Stats is owned by the NFL. Like, you know, they're operated upstairs in our building. So if and when there's a problem with the website or there's something we, we have a recommendation of what they could add, like we can kind of just write to them on Slack and message them the ideas. But PFF is a fully separate company, as you probably know. <laughs> they're owned by, you know, Chris Collinsworth groups. They're based in Cincinnati. So they're a partner of ours, but we don't own them. So if there's something we don't like about their site, we're kind of just stuck with it. But yeah, those are the big two for analytics. And then we also, we have miscellaneous kind of one-off partners. With like, for example, Elias Sports Bureau. Like if we have something really in the weeds that we have no idea how we'd even approach, like we're a partner of theirs. So we could ask them and they'd be able to help us out with that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, it's a good mix of you know public stuff and then the private stuff that we pay for that we know is going to help us out. Are you on kind of like a first name basis with Elias Sports Bureau at this point? <laughs> Uh, me personally, I'd say no. I'll definitely say Jack Andre, the manager of editorial research is at this point. Uh, he's always 
all over them <laughs> for stuff. But again, since now I'm with the analytics team, you know, Elias is obviously not really built for that. They're more built for the editorial narrative type stuff. First player since 1950 with touchdown on his birthday in two straight years, whatever, something like that. You know, the kind of stuff that's interesting still, but not like football analytics specific. What is the most absurd stat you think you may have heard during a broadcast? I don't know if there's any that just have stuck in your head over the years. Mm-hmm. That just you're like, wow, did that really need to be said? I'm glad you came up with it, but did that really need to be said? If we're allowed to go outside of football, you ever seen the Thaddeus Young stat? I have not, but I am intrigued. Uh, you got to uh, Google it after this call ends, but it is. Yes, uh, it's you know so what I'm talking good. About. The yeah, Thaddeus so Young funny. stat is great. Uh, yeah, you should look it up. I don't want to spoil it, but basically it's an absurd statistical comparison where it compares him to like the best NBA players ever based on wildly picked arbitrary cutoffs. It'd be like players to average, you know, 13.8 points, like 6.4 rebounds and 31% from three point range, like in their first eight seasons or something ridiculous like that. So that's just one that came to mind. And I'm a Sixers fan also, so I'm a pro Thaddeus guy, but yeah, that's just one that stands out as being wildly absurd. Give me some homework here for after the show. Okay. Thaddeus yeah. Young researching that up. Were you a big like sports science fan when you were growing up? Uh, yeah, that's, that was always fun to watch you, the John Brankus show. That's honestly something I think, I think it'd be really cool if we created that because you know, with the next gen stats data, we have the chips in the player's pads. So we know how fast are moving at any point, and then we can track their acceleration. And whoa, you guys have we know how heavy they are. I didn't. Uh, know yeah, that's that. actually the, the primary source of our data because the chips are in the players' pads. I think that's been the case since 2016. That's at least how far we have data for on the website. And so those chips will track you know how fast a player moved at top speed on a certain play, or how many total yards he travels during a game. It's kind of various player performance type stuff. They also help for personnel. You know, you can see where somebody's in the field, so they can easily classify a play as you know those 12 personnel, two tight ends, or they can say it was 11 personnel because the guys lined up wide based on what the chips tell you but yeah the chips are kind of the the primary source of the meat and potatoes of the data that we end up using are they gatorade proof just in case you know celebration stuff happen you know it's technology stuff can break from time to time uh they got to be pretty strong if they can withstand you know many many hits over the course of the game so i would assume they are but you know it's above my pay grade to answer that for sure yeah it's how they figured out uh sean mcveigh was able to run i think it was like 16 miles per hour at top speed to catch deshaun jackson in the end zone last Uh, week some weird stat like that and one of the, one of my favorites was like it was a play where somebody else I think it was Damien Williams that name but whoever scored doesn't matter but it was a play where Tyree Kill didn't have the ball and just decided to catch up to him because he's fast enough to do and I think Tyree Kill reached like almost twenty three miles an hour without the ball just running to catch up to his teammate for fun on a touchdown run which was like it's kind of the fun example of things we can do using the chips and the pads. I'm going to ask you kind of like a philosophical question here because I recently came across a TED talk basically talking about how players were a hundred years ago versus now. Do you think that it's mostly technology that's gotten better or do you think we as human beings have gotten better, perfected the perfect athletic profile um, it's obviously a mix. We're talking football specifically. I think it is largely both technology and also just general evolution of schemes and just how the game is played, not from a physical standpoint, but just in terms of how much people know about the game and are able to kind of exploit the rules. You know, like people will talk about, you know, could the 85 Bears like stop teams today? I mean, of course they're tough enough. I'm sure they're a tough group of dudes, but like they just saw a basic inside zone read like option. They would have no idea what the hell to do about it. They just like, I think, I think the game's just evolved so much from a scheme standpoint. That's why the quality of play is as good as it is today. And let alone like an RPO and things like that they were just sure they're tough as hell but what are they going to do about that that they've never seen before so i do think that's the biggest thing you know back in the early days the four pass just been invented so it's like even if these guys are super tough which they are you know talking about concrete chuck guys like that they'd be lost today not because of physicality not solely because of that but more because just the game has evolved so much and there's a lot more going on we were talking about baseball a little bit earlier and kind of the thing that's kind of been the trendy part is the hybrid coach and gm type like aj hinch was kind of the first one to have a lot of success with it we've had heard talks about like guys like Sam Fold, like former players that bridge the gap between front office and being players as managers. But we don't see as much of that in the NFL. Like Arthur Smith is one of those examples of guys who hasn't played very much and has some background before that. But is that like one of the next evolutions of the sport in terms of like guys who are analytically versed and front office first, then coming down to be coaches? If it does happen, I think it'll happen very slowly. I do think, you know, an important part of football culture is that there's definitely a, you know, a mindset of that, like you need to have played, or at least it helps a lot, which when you're in locker rooms for so many years of your life, being a player, you know, you know how game planning works, you know how, what it's like to watch film and draw up schemes and figure out how to attack a certain team and kind of obsess over that team's tendencies. So I do think it's a valid standpoint. That doesn't mean pl- people who haven't played before can't be good coaches. I mean, or GMs, you know, look at, I know Jet Fish, you know, he worked his way up. He's been a position coach in the NFL for a while. He's now uh, at Arizona. He's with UCLA 
play for a bit as well. The bef- that was before I got there. He's never played it down before, but scrapped his way up. And Howie Roseman, Eagles GM, you know, he's never played it down before, but he has a Super Bowl ring as a GM, even though we've had some questionable draft picks in time since, um, unfortunately. I think it'll be a very slow po- process for that stigma in football to be removed where, you know, people will be willing to accept that somebody who has never played could be a good head coach because, yeah, you know, it hasn't been done that many times. Like, even though you know, guys like Fish and Roseman, like, even though they exist, they're definitely the exceptions to the rule and the, and the very rare exceptions at that. So I do think it'll be a while before we see yeah, guys who didn't play much or at all be coaches. But at the same time, if we're talking about like hybrid type, I think that could be much more in play. You know, think about a guy like John Lynch, who obviously former great NFL player and then now 49ers GM. They've had a lot of success under him. And he's not technically a coach, but I'm sure he could be if he really put his mind to it. And he's an example of the kind of guy who might be able to kind of, you know, do both. I'm sure there are a lot of other guys like him out there that could eventually maybe bridge that gap. Yeah, I could definitely see the difficulties in a sport like football there, in particular when it comes down to how head coaches are hired or OCs are hired. It just all comes from that like coaching pipeline. So it'd be kind of hard to see a outsider more or less get in there. Kyle, do you have a question real quick? Yeah, no, I do for sure. One of the things that was interesting before was uh, we were talking about evolutions of the sport of football and like the body, you know, like uh, this being like the best version of football that we've seen. So if I had to ask, what do you think is the next evolution schematically? in football. I think kind of the path we've been on is putting the defense in situations where they can't be right. You know, think about early part of the 2010s, kind of just the basic zone read where you leave a defensive end on blocks, kind of choose a hand it off or not based on what he does. And then later in the decade, we had the RPOs, you know, where the, the lineman can block kind of, even though it looks like a run block, it's still, they don't go too far downfield where they're ineligible. So you still can throw the ball and that forces conflict defenders to kind of pick a side and you try to make them be wrong. So I think the next stage is sort of the full field. And I think the way to do that will end up being sort of plays where I don't think the right way phrase is pass, pass options because it sounds weird but I think it'll be plays where multiple people on the field can throw the ball kind of like a recess style thing where you know you can start the play with you know a lateral pass to a receiver who's lined up wide and he has the option to either throw it from there as if you're you know playing pick up you know recess football or he can just keep tucking and run it I think things like that are going to be next frontier where not just you have the option to run or pass but multiple people can do either one of those things with the ball and just kind of and make it be like recess football turn the defense into total chaos I know one of the big goals of Next Gen Stats that I've come across is the importance of improving player safety. And Next Gen was used in development of the new helmets are used in today's versus five years ago. I know we had the whole AB drama a couple of years back when he was threatening to retire over keeping his old helmet there. What is your personal thoughts on the role of analytics and player safety moving forward? How do you foresee that evolving as we progress? Yeah, I think the game's been going in the right direction, or at least I think most rules have been made with the right intent is what I'd say. I do think there are a lot of situations where the intent of a rule is right, but it turns out being executed in the wrong way, mainly to paints of penalties. You know, I think like targeting as a concept, I think it should exist. I think if you really spear a dude, you know, lower your head and just totally with dirty intent, I think, you know, you should be tossed. But I think there are a lot of situations where, you know, guys are kind of in situations where they're just making the right play and it happens to sort of look bad because the QB happened to slide right before contact's made and it looks like it was a dirty hit and it wasn't. I think in that regard, we sometimes go too far and trying to enforce the rules. So I guess what I would say is like the intent of the rule is good, but sometimes the execution is bad. Uh, But in terms of more broad off the field stuff, I think it's going in the right direction. I think, especially you think about practice habits, like, you know, even as recently when I was in middle school, you know, 10 plus years ago, like we would be going full pads to the ground every day in practice for days a week, probably Monday through Thursday. And then we have a game Saturday and we rinse and repeat. So you're just even if the hits aren't that big, like you're not getting concussions every day, you're still taking something because of hits over and over again. And so you play the game for enough years, that adds up. Whereas I think nowadays there's so many rules about, not just with the pros, but obviously at lower levels as well, just limiting the amount of contact you take in practice because at the end of the day, no matter what the equipment is and what the rules are, football's going to be a dangerous game. You have guys at full speed trying to hit each other. So the risk of injury is never going to be totally mitigated. It's going to exist, but the best you can do to minimize it is just minimize the total instances where an injury could occur. And not just that, but also minimize the sudden because of hits that could add up so I think we're going in the right direction in that regard for sure in terms of how many of the practices you can be full padded for and all that kind of stuff so I think we're going in the right direction I think that's going to be the way it continues to go fortunately I think the collateral damage to that will be that there's going to be some really bad penalties that are called where you think the defender was totally clean and he probably was and they're going to throw a flag because they think they're doing the right thing and that's going to suck for sure from a fan standpoint you know it sucks when there's a, a yeah. clean looking hit and you get 15 yards and a first down you're like what the hell could I have done differently but I think it's going to be unavoidable in terms of the general trend of the sport 
over time, do you think that we're going to kind of become accustomed to this idea just as as like fans watching the game? Because I feel like for myself, I, I'm sitting here born post 2000. And I feel like the era of like big hits being celebrated was never something that I got. So I feel like there's just kind of a, an acclimation period of sorts where what I'm seeing now is, is more what I've been seeing for the most part, because I grew up in a post concussion settlement post CTE NFL. Mm. Um, yeah, well, I, was, I think I'm already kind of accustomed to it. I, mean, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say we are at nor that we'll ever be at a point where big hits aren't celebrated because that's still like a far, part of the sport. You know, you're playing defense, you have a great play. Like, do you want to get? Yeah, I, I just meant like that. they're not they're not like showing top tens with like big right, hits exactly. on it's not, Center anymore. It's still celebrated on the field, but I think it's not glorified from media standpoint the same way. Certainly, I think that might continue to evolve in that direction. Uh, but what I would say is what I'm already accustomed to is that even when I see a big hit on TV, like I'm already expecting a flag. It's just sort of has become the instinct because it happens so often. And especially, you know, anytime a QB slides, he's even touched, even if the touch is like, you know, on his torso and his leg, like I expect a flag to come just out of instinct because that has gotten pretty, you know, over the top recently, I would say. And honestly, my hot take, I think QBs should not slide. I think by sliding, you're putting your head closer to the ground and most offenders tackle low. Naturally, you're trying to take out a dude's legs to get him to the ground. So I think QB sliding is actually more dangerous unless you do it way before you get closer. So what is your alternative? What do you think is the alternative mode of that? I mean, I think you play it straight up. Like you're going to take more overall hits, but I think your odds of a really bad hit where you either get directly hit in the head or you get hit hard and then your head hits the ground because of whiplash. Honestly, I think playing straight up is actually going to be a safer way to go about it in terms of avoiding catastrophic, like the big head injuries. So I kind of like touched on it, but do you think we are seeing the best brand of football? Do you think we've kind of like peaked, like in terms of like numbers where we have all these influx of numbers to get better and improve the sport? When you watch something like baseball, it become home run derby, the three true outcomes, home run, strikeout, walk. When you watch a NBA game, it's been three point, three point, three point over the last few years. What about a NFL game? The forward pass has definitely been a bigger point of emphasis over the last few years. But are we seeing the best brand of football now? Or do you think that there is a next evolution Scheme wise, I think evolution is never really going to stop. You know, I think it's always going to be next frontier is what can be done differently to exploit, you know, rules and all that. In terms of the quality of the players themselves, it's obviously extremely hard to project, but I do think we're, we might be reaching sort of a peak at this point. Not because I think human evolution will slow, but I think for two main reasons. I think for starters, less people are playing football nowadays, just from a youth level. You know, you see like the Pop Warner and the high school numbers, you know, come out every year and there seems to be a trend of slight decline. So strictly from a number standpoint, obviously, if you have a smaller pool of people to pick from, your odds of getting more elite players goes down just from sheer probability so i think that's one core reason because people are you know the current generation of kids growing up and their families like they're a lot more aware and concerned about head injuries than people were 30 plus years ago so that impacts your pool of players a lot and the second reason i think is the byproduct of the changing rules about you know less contact and practice and i think it's a necessary thing because you know if you play football from age six to age 36 and you're going full contact to the ground and practice every day you know that's kind of cte waiting to happen just because you're taking so many sub concussive hits over and over again whereas in the modern air or now you might be only hitting you know at most 90 minutes a week maybe like it's obviously a lot different but i think the byproduct of that is that you have less time practicing actual blocking and tackling and therefore the quality of play might be slipping a bit just because you don't have as much time to actually own those skills in a full-on setting so for those reasons i think we might be roughly reaching a peak in terms of how good the actual players on the field are but obviously it remains to be seen you know i could be totally wrong we could have a next generation of guys that all look like dk metcalf so we'll see <laughs> God, that's a scary thought, ain't it? Right? There's yeah. a bunch of Derrick Henrys running across the field. Right, right. Actually, who is a scarier person there? DK Metcalf or Derrick Henry? Who would you least want to tackle in the open field bowl? Um, it's a good question. I think I think I probably I think I probably have a better chance of taking Henry down just because I'm gonna dive at his ankles, hope I trip him up. Whereas I think Metcalf, he just he's so fast and such leaping ability, he might just jump over me or shake me before I even get the chance to do so. Whereas Henry, maybe I grab something and get lucky to slow him down enough. But neither if I'm given the fun. choice to of worst, I might say Najee Harris. That one feels scary because he's got less tread on his body. Yeah, he'd be a tough one as well. But you know, you got to find a way. You got. All right, I'll give it to you this way: you have three chances to tackle DK Metcalf for, well, let's say. $10 million versus uh, never being able to use your phone again. Are you taking that risk? So if I successfully tackle one of the three, I get the money. And if I miss all three, I don't, I lose the phone privileges. Phone privileges gone. Actually, you know what? I'll make it even riskier. Internet, you are cut off from society, my friend. And that's if I miss all three tackle attempts. If you miss all three tackles, you uh, can't. Whereas if, if I don't take the bet, nothing changes. I get no money and I keep the internet access. You go home, you get nothing, sir. Like mm. Willy Wonka at the end. Yeah, I'll, pr I'll probably I'll probably walk away. I'll probably keep the internet access. Um, yeah, it'd be a fun challenge, enough. but you know, ultimately, I'm like you know, I'm five eight, like 
200, you know, it's probably not happening. Probably. Exactly. DK got a spin move, a stiff arm. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff going on there to plan for. Kyle, any closing thoughts before we head out? Nothing to do with anything you're doing in your profession or your job or the cool stuff that you're doing. I just want to know the story of the water bottle because it is the Super Bowl 55 one that I kept uh, seeing pop yeah, up. Yeah, it's so good it was- observation for sure. Unfortunately, I was not at the game. Uh, kind of our top end, most veteran researchers do get to go to the game annually. So a few of my friends were able to go to the game in Tampa last year, Super Bowl 55. Uh, I was not one of them. I was still peon at that point. Still am kind of only third season. But if they do the NFL, they give the employees a bunch of Super Bowl memorabilia, even for people who weren't there. So I got this bottle. I still have actually a ticket to the game. Like obviously I didn't get it the game day, otherwise I would have gone. But like after the game, they gave us Super Bowl tickets and other little stuff like a duffel bag, a hat that have Super Bowl logos on them. So yeah, just small perks that they'll give us, you know, throw us a bone. <laughs> All right, Cole. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I, I think it was very insightful to kind of like get your perspective on some things coming from a different kind of point of view. I know you're not necessarily coming on here plugging anything, but maybe some social media handles you want to drop, get some more followers just in case. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, pretty much anytime I do public football content, I'll put it out on Twitter. My handle's Cole Jacobson 32 all one word. Uh, Jacobson is S-O-N at the end, not S-E-N. That's about it, really. I mean, I, and then from a company standpoint, I'd say at NFL Research and then at next gen stats are two of them that I will occasionally contribute to. And obviously it's good to help get the rest of my, you know, coworkers stuff out there. So they're always putting out good stuff on game days, especially even the office in a little bit, but really game day is when we're turning stuff out. So highly recommend those two as well on Twitter. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. Cole, thank you for coming on. Kyle, thank you for being with me. Slump Busters, thank you for being along for the ride. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button. Check out our partner, CavemanCoffeeCo.com. Come on, don't be a jump. Use promo code slump at CavemanCoffeeCo.com for a 15 percent off your delicious cold brew coffee stay safe happy and healthy and we will see you next time